Thanks very much for staying with us. Time now for Eye on Africa with me, Georgia Calvin Smith. Tonight, a politically tumultuous day for Somalia as the lower house of parliament tries to extend the president's term by two years, but the Senate is having none of it. This after the capital's police chief is fired for trying to hold up the parliamentary session. Also, also, growing calls from within Africa for the continent to boost its vaccine manufacturing capacity as richer regions are accused of hoarding COVID-19 inoculations. The continent's reliance on importing scarce, scarce jabs has fed into a worryingly slow rollout of vaccination drives. And hundreds of containers of Italian trash, which was illegally shipped to Tunisia, disguised as recyclable plastic waste, are still stuck in port at Sousse. Furious Tunisians are demanding that the rubbish be returned. But first, Somalia's political crisis took another twist on Monday after the lower house of parliament voted to extend the president's term by two years before the measure was quickly rejected by the Senate. Known as Famaju, President Mohamed Abdullahi Mohamed's mandate ended in February, but a delay to elections has left the country in limbo. The opposition accuses Famaju of weighting state institutions with his allies in a bid to stay in power one way or the other. He denies this. Amanda Sperber brings us more on this dramatic day from Mogadishu. It was an extremely dramatic day today, indeed, really an inflection point for politics in Somalia. For the past few months, uh, the country, and specifically Mogadishu, uh, has been in a stalemate after the president's mandate expired on February 8th without a structure in place on how to vote for the next leader. Um, a Somali president has never held a second term in office before, and every election cycle has been contentious, but the anger and mistrust between political players have reached new heights, and the government is at a perilous point. This is the first time a presidential term has ended before an agreement about how to proceed with an election has been reached. So, for the last week, uh, then last week for the first time, uh, leaders from the federal member states sat with the head of the government to try to map out a way forward. It had taken nearly a month to get everyone in the same city and into the same room. Then two days later, after they managed to do that, the talks collapsed. There were a few days of scurrying in the last few days. Then late last night, news broke that parliament would be in session. This was a already a big turn of events because there was concern um, about parliament sitting because some people, you know, there's belief that the mandate ha for the sitting government has expired. Um, there was also concern that the lower house would vote to extend the Farmajo's mandate, which is something that the international community, uh, some of the federal member states and the hardy opposition, including which includes two um, former presidents uh, and their camps, uh, would not um, would not accept. So today, Parliament started to meet or went to meet. Um, then things quickly turned when the police commissioner. Um, blocked Parliament from sitting, saying that Parliament should not sit, making a statement on television that um, Parliament shouldn't sit until the leaders had fleshed out a election structure. From there, within the next 20 minute, minutes, he was fired, replaced with a new commissioner. Soon after that, Parliament sat. Soon after that, they voted to extend. Soon after that, uh, the upper house rejected the extension. Um, FMS and opposition candidates have put out um, a very strident statements saying, um, you know, that the Farmajo administration cannot be responsible for what happens at this point, making statements that things could then start, things could now start to split along clan lines um, because it's you know unclear who's in charge. Uh, so yes, today was quite a moment. The Main things that I'm hearing from insiders is just that the next few days are really going to be are really going to be crucial. That roundup there for us by Amanda Sperber. Now, Africa has to expand its capacity to manufacture vaccines as the continent falls behind in the global race to inoculate its people against COVID-19. Currently, 99% of inoculations are imported and the region accounts for only 2% of the total shots given so far throughout the world. 
Rich countries have been accused of hogging some vaccines, but African leaders have also said that equity on this front needs the region to up production of its own jabs and other medical products. Delano Zissouza with more. A plan to combat current and future pandemics across Africa. Leaders from the African Union kicked off a two-day meeting to discuss the supply of coronavirus vaccinations. The continent has struggled to acquire inoculations, and the leader of the country hardest hit by COVID-19 in Africa says things must change. In ensuring an effective response to the current pandemic, we must strengthen our ability to both respond to future health emergencies and to achieve health security for the people of our continent. The African continent imports 99% of all its vaccines. The aim is to bring this figure down to 40%. Currently, Africa is falling behind in the global vaccination race. Just 13 million people on a continent of 1.3 billion have received at least one inoculation. With the lowest rate of vaccine delivery, 1.1 doses per 100 people. In North America, the figure is over 40. This is morally unconscionable and a serious economic hit. The head of the World Health Organization, meanwhile, echoed calls by developing countries for vaccine manufacturers to suspend medical patents during the pandemic. We continue to call on companies to share know-how, intellectual property and data with other qualified vaccine manufacturers, including in low and middle income countries. While African leaders are aware scaling up manufacturing capacity will require long-term investments, they'll be looking to leaders in generic drug manufacturing like Brazil and India for guidance. Meanwhile, the continent continues to rely on support in getting hold of vaccine stock. On Sunday, Cameroon, which has been hit hard by a second wave, took delivery of 200,000 doses of China's Sinopharm jab, However, there are mounting concerns about its effectiveness. Regina Sondo with more. The Minister of Public Health has urged Cameroonians to get vaccinated, saying it's the only solution against coronavirus. But then Cameroonians remain skeptical about getting themselves vaccinated. Some of them have even taken to social media saying they are not going to get vaccinated. Now, the Prime Minister at the airport said yesterday that uh, health officials were going to be the first to get the vaccination. Le ministre de la Santé publique va s'assurer que le personnel de la santé qui nous traite, nous tous, soit d'abord vaccin. Donc c'est d'abord à eux la priorité. Et ensuite, le reste des Camerounais. Quant à moi, je suis prêt à prendre sur la scène n'importe quand parce que les professionnels de la santé nous disent que c'est la meilleure chose à faire. On Sunday, a top... Uh control disease official in China in a rare acknowledgement said uh, current Chinese vaccines offer low protection against the coronavirus. He said possible steps uh, to increase the effectiveness of Chinese uh, vaccines include changing the amount of vaccines given, the number of shots, the time between shots or the type of vaccines given. It's worth noting that Cameroon has recorded over 60,000 coronavirus cases and about one thousand deaths. Regina Sondo there for us. Now, the Italian firm that illegally shipped hundreds of containers of household waste to Tunisia still hasn't reclaimed its rubbish. Customs officials seized the cargo, which was supposed to be recyclable plastic scrap last summer. The scandal led to the arrest and sacking of the Tunisian Minister of Environment and prompted demands that the disguised trash be returned. But for now, it's still stuck in a port in eastern Tunisia. Our correspondents report. Roses and rubbish bags in front of the Italian embassy. These demonstrators are demanding that the region of Campania take back 7,800 tons of city waste which was exported to Tunisia and has been stuck in the port of Sousse for almost a year. This journalist is one of those who last November blew the whistle on the affair. The scandal has outraged environmental activists. 
Tunisia already struggles with its own waste management and high levels of pollution. Hussein Hamdi works with an organization that tries to raise awareness about the importance of waste sorting. Les déchets arrivent, donc là on les passe dans, 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 dans ces cages-là de, de, de stockage. Donc après, on a une sorte de chaîne de production, je veux dire, ces chaînes de montage donc en U. Donc là on trie donc les, les déchets, on fait la séparation de matière. For him, the Italian waste scandal is too much. Vraiment, ça décrédibilise certaines parties prenantes en Europe. Et nous, on croit que l'Europe est un partenaire aussi. Ça explique un peu la tendance aussi à rendre l'Afrique, c'est pas seulement la Tunisie aussi, mais l'Afrique la poubelle de, de l'Europe malheureusement. Several cases relating to the scandal are working their way slowly through Tunisia's court system. Some think a bilateral diplomatic agreement could resolve the issue, but it hasn't worked yet. Tunisia has granted several delays to the Italian company in question, but they've been to court many times and the repatriation has not yet happened. Well, that's it for Iron Africa for now. Thanks for joining us. Do so again. Take care.